And I'm delighted to introduce to you Senator Kathleen Vinout, the 31st State Senate District. She is a person I think is going to be a leader in our state, and we're proud to have her at Fighting Bob Fest as a speaker. Please welcome Kathleen Vinout. Thank you, Ed. Every time Glenn goes to work, he's got one hand pressed against his stomach, and he's trying to hold in his intestines because he's got a hernia, and he's got trouble walking because he's got a bad knee, and he hasn't been to the doctor for five years, and he called my office a few weeks ago and asked me for help. And just a Saturday before, Mark, who milks 115 cows over in Arcadia in western Wisconsin, called me at home on Saturday because he had gotten a notice from his insurance company that the insurance company was going to raise his rates $600. Now, Mark already pays $3,800 a month for health insurance. I about dropped the phone when he told me this. And he told me he was unlucky enough to have suffered two heart attacks. And I said, this, I've heard a lot of really bad healthcare stories. Every day I hear another bad healthcare story, but this is about the worst I've ever heard. I hear about how people lost their jobs and they lost their health insurance, how people were unlucky enough to have a pre-existing condition and paid, like Mark, nearly their entire income how people who had faithfully paid their premiums for 20 years had their policies dropped because they got sick. Glenn, the fellow with the hernia, is a small business owner in Jackson County, and he actually has insurance, but he could only afford a high deductible plan. And those conservatives would tell you that these high deductible plans are the answer to our health care crisis. But Glenn told me he couldn't afford the high deductible because business is down, he's in the tourism business, times are tight, people aren't traveling, and he can't afford to see a doctor, and so every day he suffers. Now, Mark suffers in a different way. First of all, the pain of knowing you've had two heart attacks and you might suffer another one is difficult enough, but when every single dime you make goes in to pay your health insurance premiums and then if you know any dairy farmers, you know the price of milk dropped to about half over the last 20 months or so. And he can't afford to suffer, he can't afford to support his family. So he's faced with either dropping coverage, which puts his family farm at risk, or not being able to buy groceries. Mark's is an impossible choice. What the insurance company was doing was raising Mark's rates so high that he was forced to drop insurance. The company calls it purging. It's disgusting word for a despicable practice. The same thing happened to a business in western Wisconsin. Two of their 40 employees got, were unlucky enough to get sick this year. And they're looking at a raise on premiums of 47%. These stories reveal the deliberate policy decisions of insurance companies. And so do the tactics we've seen all over the United States. First, appear as if you support health care. Pour money into a public relations campaign and lobbying effort. Fight behind the scenes every step of the way. Use front groups to do your dirty work. Those ideological front groups like uh, embarrassyourcongressman.now.com. Embarrassyourcongressmannow.com. And then use personal attacks to discredit the reformers. Two years ago, and only six months into my job as a rookie senator, I found myself at the center of the health care reform debate in Wisconsin. When I ran for Senate, for State Senate, I was an uninsured dairy farmer. I spent almost 10 years milking cows, and like Mark, health care became more expensive than any other farm cost except for feed. So we, in our family, made the impossible choice of going without insurance. I know firsthand what it feels like, the embarrassment, 
You feel afraid. You feel like somehow you're responsible. You lay up awake at night worrying about what happens to someone you love if they have an accident or your child wakes up sick. Six weeks before the election, my worst fears were realized. I was at a union meeting and I received a phone call and my son had been taken to the emergency room and required emergency surgery. His appendix had ruptured. And if any of you have kids or grandkids out there, you know this feeling. Cold fear went through my veins and my mouth went dry and I couldn't speak. A total of $15,000 later and three scars on my son's tummy, my son was fine. But we had to refinance the farm in order to pay the hospital bill. Not every family would have had the equity in their farm to be able to pay that bill. It was with these experiences fresh in my mind that I began my new role as senator and faced an incredible opportunity. Senator Judy Robson, who was then the majority leader in the Senate, charged the Senate Democrats on the health committee. Senator Mark Miller, who's here and who will speak a little bit later, um, Senator Erpen, John Erpenbach, Senator Tim Carpenter, and myself with crafting a statewide health care reform proposal. And before I was a dairy farmer, I spent 10 years teaching health policy at the University of Illinois in Springfield, Illinois. And every public policy professor's dream is to someday craft that policy which they teach. And so for me, this was a dream coming true. We spent six months poring over details of, what's of what worked in other states and other countries. And in June of 2007, we unveiled Healthy Wisconsin, which was a plan to bring the same health care that I now had as a state senator to every child, woman, and man in the state of Wisconsin. Very quickly, the spin machine of the anti-reformers rose up against us. And I was a prime target because I was a neophyte senator who had spent two years without health insurance. And my family and I were attacked in the Milwaukee media. I was accused of willful negligence for not insuring my son. We were attacked as liberal academics, masquerading as farmers, as if anyone could do dairy farming part-time. <laughs> And the leader of the assembly called me a socialist, and when he did, I responded, it's only been since 1906 when Teddy Roosevelt first introduced health care reform that the health care reformers have been called socialists. <laughs> now, socialist was also the accusation of those people that went before him. Those who courageously fought for fair wages in the eight-hour day in a safe workplace free of discrimination. And those benefits that we take for granted today are because of the blood and the tears and the sacrifice of those who came before us. And one of my heroes, whose example gave me strength during this fight for health care reform, was a woman named Mary Harris. But you probably know her better as Mother Jones. Yeah. Born in Ireland in 1830, Mary immigrated to America when she was but five years old, and at age 37, she found herself a widow. Her husband, George Jones, and her four children had all died in the yellow fever epidemic. She moved to Chicago, where four years later, she lost everything she owned in the great Chicago fire. She was truly a woman with nothing left to lose. And in her autobiography, she wrote, those were the days of sacrifice for the cause of labor. In the late 19th century, houses were heated by coal that was mined by miners who were virtual slaves of the company. 14-hour days were common. Wages were kept at a bare minimum. The miners were paid in scrip. That's a fake currency that they could only cash at the company store, place where prices, of course, were inflated. The company owned the shacks. 
The company owned the land where the miners' families lived. They owned the schools, the churches, the roads. And when the miners began to use the strike as a way to force better working conditions and pay, the company took their home and took their possessions, leaving the workers without protection. So it's little tent cities sprouted up all around the mines where there was a strike. And standing barely five feet tall and speaking with a thick Irish brogue, Mother Jones became a common, uh, common sight among the miners who were working to organize against the company. The miners called her the angel of the miners, and she traveled all across the country, organizing everywhere she went. She organized the men. She organized the women who beat on their, on their pots and pans with a hammer. And she even, went in one strike, organized the mules that were down in the mine. <laughs> She watched those impoverished mothers struggle over sending their little tiny children to labor in the mines and in the textile mills. And I want, you to, I want to read you just a couple sentences from her autobiography. Little girls and boys barefoot walked up and down the endless rows of spindles, reaching their thin little hands into the machinery to repair those snap threads. They crawled under the machinery to oil it. They replaced the spindles all day long, tiny little babies of six with faces of 60. They worked for an eight-hour shift for 10 cents a day, and if they fell asleep, the supervisors dashed cold water on their face to wake them up. Now, Mother Jones organized these children. Some of them were maimed from working in the textile mills, and she took them from town to town, from Pennsylvania all the way to Tenney Roosevelt's home in Oyster Bay, to dramatize the case of abolishing child labor. And when the laws protecting children were finally passed in Pennsylvania, they were attacked by the critics, and the laws were called job killers. Now, they called Mother Jones the most dangerous woman in America. And in River Falls, Wisconsin, out in western Wisconsin where I live, during a presentation on Healthy Wisconsin, I overheard a physician, and I know Gene Farley's here, and I don't want to speak bad of physicians, but this was a specialist sitting in the back room, one of those guys that does, does uh, plastic surgery, that kind of stuff. He was sitting in the back room talk, talking to the only other Republican that was in the room, and he said in a very loud voice, looking at me, she is a dangerous woman. I thought of Mother Jones, and I knew I was making a difference. And I whispered to myself, go forward. And in the 2008 campaign, the Republicans used Healthy Wisconsin against every Democrat. They charged Democrats with increasing taxes by $15 billion, never mind the fact that no Democrat in the Assembly ever voted for the bill, and never mind the fact that all the Democratic challengers never voted for anything. And never mind the fact that changing the way healthcare was paid for would actually save billions of dollars, which was a fact, of course, they never mentioned. But dark pictures of aliens climbing over fences at night were used to drill home the message, illegal aliens are responsible for the healthcare crisis. By the time we returned to Madison, the Democrats took control over the Wisconsin Assembly for the first time in 14 years. <laughs> but all of them had been beat up so badly by health care reform, no one had the stomach to take up the banner again. The fear of waves and waves of illegal aliens is not a new tactic to scare us out of health care reform. I recently read a biography of Eleanor Roosevelt, and in there she... She talks about in the 1930s, California proposed a health care system. And those who attacked and destroyed the proposal threatened waves and waves of illegal aliens coming into California. About that same time, Tommy Douglas, who was a Baptist minister in the Calvary Baptist Church in Weyburn, Saskatchewan, decided it was time to give up his church and run for the House of Commons. Tommy saw the people suffering because of the drought and the Great Depression and families couldn't afford to see a doctor. Tommy was burying the young men in his congregation because they couldn't afford to go to the hospital. They didn't leave anybody behind to take care of their family. 
And Tommy joined something called the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which was the Socialist Democratic Party. He campaigned for social justice, he campaigned for fair farm prices, for collective bargaining, and for health care for all. He later became premier of Saskatchewan and he created a program to provide free hospitalization to all citizens, which was the beginning of what we now know as Canadian Medicare. In the, in the summer of 1962, Saskatchewan became the hotbed of health care reform. The American, United States, the American Medical Association organized their Canadian colleagues to form the Saskatchewan doctor's strike to destroy Canadian Medicare. The doctors feared government-run health care. Ads on television created fear that said the government would come between doctors and patients. Doctors claimed that the government would import foreign doctors and used racist images to scare the public. Tommy was not even premier when the whole thing was finally implemented, but his success spread to Ottawa. And by 1960, 1966, the federal government encouraged other provinces to adopt the Saskatchewan Medicare. It took Tommy 26 years from that first election until Medicare finally passed in Saskatchewan. But it took a mere four years for it to be adopted all across the country. And for Tommy Douglas, this was his greatest legacy. And the man who lost an election, who had his campaign headquarters destroyed by his enemies, was voted in 2004 as the greatest Canadian of all time. When I went back to Madison, in January, I mulled all this over. When I was, I was thinking of Mother Jones and Eleanor Roosevelt and Tommy Douglas and the obstacles that we were facing here in Wisconsin. And in an effort to re-energize my legislative colleagues, I drafted five bills to make small steps forward in health insurance reform. And you probably didn't know this, but Wisconsin has some of the most lax insurance regulations in the country worse than Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. And I don't want to pick on anybody from the southern states because I know some folks from Eau Claire are from the southern states and they'll beat me up later. But the states, those states often occupy the bottom rankings when it comes to health care. But when it came to the individual insurance market and pre-existing conditions, Wisconsin had no rules at all governing that egregious practice of look back, saying, Judy, you should have known you should have known 10 years ago when you had that high cholesterol test that you were going to have a heart attack. So we're not going to cover any of the bills related to your heart attacks that you just had now. Never mind the fact that you spent the last 20 years paying your premiums on time. My five-point plan targeted those most egregious practices and they made small steps forward that were immediately achievable. Now, Everybody knows that the governor opposed Healthy Wisconsin, but he saw the wisdom of this plan and he actually took it and put it in the budget. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel called it the most significant health care reform in a decade. And the plan is now law in the state of, of Wisconsin, just like in Mississippi and Alabama. <laughs> and it was in Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, in September of 1955, that a weary Rosa Parks decided she would rather go to jail than give up her seat on the city bus. And there was a young preacher at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. And when that Montgomery bus strike needed a spokesperson, the local community leaders went to Martin, who was only 26 at the time, and said, Martin, will you lead us? And he said reluctantly, okay. The bus strike dragged on for weeks, for months. Martin was arrested twice. His house was bombed with his wife Coretta and his nine-week-old baby inside. But Dr. King did not give up. He said, go forward. He told his people, the Montgomery bus strike will continue. Finally, over a year later, the Supreme Court wrote it illegal to discriminate on city buses and the bus strike was over and a new movement had begun. Now Martin wrote a book about his experiences in Alabama and at a book signing in Harlem, King was stabbed in the chest by a demented woman and he, ever since that he told his closest friends that every time he got up in the morning and put his shirt on, he 
He saw that scar in the mirror and he knew that today might be his last. And that realization gave Martin an intensity about everything he did. You and I are organizers and Martin thought and operated as an organizer. The Southern Leadership, Christian Leadership Conference was formed and with its backbone were the African American churches in the South. But Martin went everywhere. He went to the pool halls. He went wherever he could find people. In his own words, he said about organizing, it's hard. It's a tedious job to rouse people from their apathy, but rouse them he did. In Selma, Dr. King tried to convince the adults to join a, a peaceful march, but they were apathetic, and probably more than that, they were afraid. So he went to the schools, and he tried to get the children to join the march, and the young people did. Go forward, he told them. And the kids marched, and the white people joined them. And 54 miles they marched from Selma to Montgomery. Thousands joined the marchers on the steps of the Capitol, and President Johnson compared that march in Selma to those patriots in the American Revolution. And the Voting Rights Bill was unveiled to Congress and the nation. Rosa Parks' act of courage happened in 1955, but it was nine years later until the Civil Rights Movement passed and 10 years before the Voting Rights Act passed. Martin never gave up. He said, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving and go forward. Now, Martin never knew all the people he inspired. And in 1969, about 1 o'clock in the morning, an unremarkable little gay bar on Christopher Street in Greenwich Village was raided. It was called the Stonewall Inn. Seven plainclothes policemen entered the bar and started roughing up people and pulling them out and asking for IDs and throwing them in the paddy wagon. But the patrons decided they were not going to go. And for the first time ever, they started to fight back. The officers were called in from the tactical patrol force. They were two dozen massively proportioned riot police who linked arm in arm Roman Legion style to push back the protesters. They beat the protesters with clubs and the protesters disbanded. But they went around the police and they organized down the street behind the police. And by now hundreds of people had come out in the street and the riot police whirled around and saw they were faced with their worst nightmare. A chorus of mocking queens. <laughs> their arms clasped around each other, kicking up their heels, rocket style, and singing at the top of their lungs, we are the Stonewall girls, we wear our hair in curls, we wear our dungarees above our nelly knees. The following evening, the demonstrators returned and numbers swelled to thousands and leaflets were handed out and protesters gathered and new organizations were founded and the leaders of the fledgling gay rights movement yelled to their supporters, go forward. Yeah. Now when Yahweh called the Israelites out of Egypt, and they were standing at the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army was hot on their heels. Moses didn't say to the people, I think we went too far, let's go back. He said to the people, go forward. And when Mother Jones led her boys into the strikes against the mining company, she didn't say, oh my God, I made the company angry. Let's go back to the boarding house. She said, pray for the dead, <laughs> pray for the dead, fight like hell for the living, and Go forward. When Tommy Douglas was facing crowds of angry people organized by doctors from America to stop the Saskatchewan Medicare system, Tommy didn't give up. He didn't back down. He told the people of Saskatchewan, go forward. And when Martin Luther King faced hundreds of angry white men in the city of Birmingham run by the bigot Bull Connor, he led the people from Selma, Alabama to Birmingham after those poor children 
had been attacked by dogs and fire hoses. He didn't say, the time isn't right, I think I'll go back. He said to the people, go forward. And when a line of drag queens on Christopher Street linked arms and started to sing, they didn't give up, even though they were most surely afraid. They said, go forward. And so you, my progressive brothers and sisters, when you hear those lies and innuendos about health care reform, when you see articles that willfully misread and intentionally mischaracterize the program, when you view those multi-million dollar marketing campaign, you are confronted about the evils of health care, government run health care by the, by the people who benefit themselves. Tell them the truth. Tell them government already pays for at least half the health care bill in the United States. And for that amount, every other industrialized nation in the world can provide good health care to all its people. Tell them the truth, that they are being manipulated by a multi-billion dollar industry that wants to keep huge profits and fancy corporate jets at the expense of our suffering friends and neighbors. Tell them the truth. Tell them of the stories of Glenn and Mark. Tell them of the people you know and love that are already rationed out of the healthcare system because they're unlucky enough to get sick or work for a company that has one of those consumer-driven healthcare plans. And ladies and gentlemen, leaders of our progressive movement, remember for a moment why we are here on this earth, why we breathe and have our being. Because when all is said and done, and we lay our heads to rest, is there only one single question? What have we done for the least among us? And is there not a more compelling reason to bring health care reform to every child, woman, and man in this country? Did we realize the dreams of Senator Edward Kennedy for America where the state of a family's health will never again depend on the amount of that family's wealth. So I say to you, when you are tired of writing letters to your Congress people and those letters to the editor, when you have talked to your friends and your neighbors and feel like you can't talk again, when you have dispelled every lie and misconception, when you have joined marches, prepared posters, made phone calls, when you are weary and you feel like you cannot go on. Remember those words of Dr. King. He said, I don't determine what is right or wrong by taking a Gallup poll and asking the majority opinion. A genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but he is a molder of consensus. Then remember all of the strength and nerve of all those people gathered here today. And remember the people that you know that are suffering. And remember that you have the power to mold consensus. And go forward. Thank you very much. There's a dangerous woman. Wow. Next time someone tells you that there's no leadership in the legislature or any hope for the future, tell them about Kathleen Vinot. What a terrific uh, speaker.